to the elders and figure out not Jeremy to shuffle, right? So just things like that, I really want to start, you know, like just that ownership of, I was really excited about it. It is, and it's like trying to get a handle on things. When you Hello, hello, hello.
Hello, St. Andrews. A warm welcome to you. It is so nice to hear the din of our voices as we reacquaint with each other. Being in community is one of the reasons that we worship every week. We also worship to be equipped to be part of what God is doing in the world. And we worship that we might grow in our understanding of Jesus and what he's doing. So a warm welcome to you, whether you're with us in-house, whether you're joining us at home or at another time in the week. We're so pleased that you've set aside this time to be with us. Each week, we are learning what it means to be in relationship with the Almighty. And so you'll notice that the service order has a particular rhythm to it. And that rhythm is on purpose. It's meant to teach us what it's like to be in relationship with God. Our rhythm today will include gathering around the table. If you're at home and you haven't already, I invite you just to head over to the kitchen and grab some elements, a piece of bread, perhaps some juice that you can share with us as we gather around the table. If you're in house and you haven't already, the elements are prepared and waiting for you to be picked up just out in the foyer. Let's begin our rhythm the way that we do each week. For we did not act first, but God acted first, and so it is God who calls us. Each week, one of our elders comes and brings God's call to worship. Today, one of our new elders is come. And Trudy, thank you for bringing God's call to worship this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrews. My name is Trudy Jager, and I am one of the new serving elders. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are worshiping on the traditional lands of the Stunemo First Nations. And then I would like to ask all of you worshiping here in the sanctuary and at home online to join me in the call to worship. Um, anything that is written in yellow is for all of us. No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ, for it stands in scripture. Come to him, a living stone, rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Join us together in unity of spirit through the story they tell. The story of Jesus Christ. That we may become his holy temple. For we've asked through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and lift our voices together this morning.
to God and who he is. gathered to respond to God's call on our lives with lives of praise. I see kids itching to come up. Come on up here, kids, and let's spend some time together before you go off to some super special stuff that's been prepared for you. Come on up here. Today, our grades five and up, grades five, six and up, are actually going to stay in worship with us, and we're going to have our children come back into worship for communion a little bit later in the service. So we're looking forward to seeing you again, moms and dads. You can expect for your kids to slide in next to you as we get worship started. Around here, we believe that the communion table is for the entire family of God. And so we want that to be something that we celebrate together. Okay, we're going to talk about a super fun topic today. It's the issue. It's taxes. <laughs> Most of us aren't really fans of taxes, aren't we? Did you know that even kids pay taxes? Do you know when you spend a dollar at the store, do you make money? Do you get an allowance maybe? Yeah, you get an allowance, yeah? And what do you like to spend your allowance on? Whatever happens to turn your crank. Yeah, what do you like to spend your allowance on? That's fantastic. Giving that away, that is a huge part of what we Christians believe should, money should be used for. What do you like to spend your allowance on?
Okay. 113 That was for oddly specific. I wonder what it is that it costs $113.65. Yeah. Say again. Oh, very cool. And when you buy them, or when you spend that $113.65, 13 cents of every dollar goes back to the province and to the government. And the reason is because our hospitals are paid for from that, our roads are paid for, our schools are paid for from that. It's a way for us to pool our resources to pay for things that are too expensive for one person or for one group to pay for. Taxes have never been popular. However, they weren't popular even as far back as Jesus' day. And the story I'm going to talk to the grown-ups about today is the story of when Jesus was asked, should we pay tax? And what do you think his answer was? No. no. <laughs> That's what I would want him to say. You're absolutely right, Micah. But in fact, what he said is, if the money belongs to the government, pay it. And if the money belongs to God, pay it. What do you think belongs to God? Everything. Everything. So the whole of our lives, in fact, are given over to God, which is one of the reasons we come to be reminded of that week after week. Well, you're going to get reminded of some super, uh, other super special stuff. Melanie is waiting for you with eager anticipation. Before you go, let's have a word of prayer together, and then we'll send you all out. I invite you to repeat after me, congregation, those at home. I invite you to repeat after me as well. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you. For the example of Jesus and how he teaches us how to live. Teach us more. In his name. Amen. All right, off you go. Go have some fun, special stuff prepared for you. While they're going, congregation, I invite you to turn around. See, uh, say hi to someone perhaps you haven't seen in a while. Shake a hand, hug a neck. Let some people know you're glad to see them. If you're at home, I invite you. Get online with uh, the Catherine. She's our host today. Say hello to her and, and to others as well. We will have lots more time to get to know each other, spend some time with each other in the fellowship time following the service. That happens immediately after worship this week. You can just cross the courtyard, go to the hall, and a huge thank you to everyone who has been a part of making sure that that happens. A huge thank you also to those that are working so hard to make sure that this building is kept up well. We've had a number of surprises this last winter season. Most recently, the surprise was we showed up for work World Day of Prayer on Friday, and it was cold. And we tried to turn on the heater, and it wouldn't come on. So a huge thank you to Terry and to all of the guys who are working so hard behind the scenes to make sure that things like the furnace are taken care of so that we can worship. Yes, we need to say thank you. Absolutely. And I was reminded that we neglected to say thank you to our outgoing envelope secretaries who have worked, what was it, 13 years to keep the finances straight here. Let's give a round of applause to Bobby and to Sheila for the wonderful work that they did as well. Investing our lives in the family of God here and in the mission of God through this house is just part of why we exist at St. Andrew's here. I'm going to invite Elizabeth to come up, and she's going to share with us some about the summer camps coming. While she's coming, let me share with you about Lent and Easter volunteering. If you'd like to decorate or set things up, Marilyn and Bobby will be here on Thursday, and they will be setting up the Stations of the Cross and getting our worship space ready for the Lent and Easter festivities taking place in these next next few weeks. If you can help with that, they would welcome that. Marilyn, where are you? There she is. So those in-house can just turn around and see who she is, and uh, y'all can just chat with her about that as well.
Elizabeth, talk to us about camping. Some of the new people probably wonder, you know, how this ancient one is the one talking about camp. <laughs> but I've been involved in the camp program on Vancouver Island since the mid-70s, so not yesterday. <laughs> and the camps, for, for those that aren't familiar and are campers, we use the provincial campsites which means we have to plan a year ahead for group sites, but we also have one that's in the regular campsites. And somewhere between my computer and the church one, the, the thing I sent for FYI didn't make it. It bounced back to me two days later. So it'll be in next week, I hope. But I have posters for the three camps, and one of them is started as the gold card camp in the provincial campsites before June 15th because for seniors you get half price up till then and that's at Little Qualicum the 10th to 14th of June and then we have one at the Gold Street Provincial Park at the group site in July from the 4th to the 8th and again at Rath Trevor from the 5th to the 12th and those two are family camps. And sometimes we have, fam always we have families that are three generations of camp VIPers. So how about the family that's here that are a three generation camp VIP group stand up? <laughs> Ian, get up. <laughs> John. <laughs> you can get away with so. that because you've been at this for 40 some odd years. So, I may be the oldest at camp, but uh, that hasn't been the case until just very recently. I would suggest anyone who's interested in camping and knowing more about it, come talk to me over at coffee time. And I promise that these things will be in next week's FYI, uh, including how to register and so on. We don't program a lot of stuff. We have a speaker in the evenings, and most of the time you do your own thing. Or with other people, we play lots of card games, and there's, depending on which campsite we're at, there's other things to do. And well-behaved dogs are welcome. <laughs> Thank Sometimes you so much. we've had as many dogs as people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Some great to connect with Presbyterians up and down the island. We're also hoping to have another opportunity coming up at the end of August during Labor Day weekend for our own congregation. So we'll get some more information to you about that in just the next couple of weeks. Well, there's more than we could possibly share on a Sunday morning. The best way to get a hold of the news of this house is to sign up for the weekend emails. We've noticed that the click rate is dropping, saying that not as many are being opened. So if you've signed up, check your spam folder. Often they get end up that they end up there, and that way you can just stay on top. If you'd like to know and you don't have a paper copy of the FYI, you can always go to the website, www.standrewsnanaimo.ca, standrewsnanaimo.ca, and all of the news is there. While you're there, you can also make donations to any of the ministries of the house, including uh, funds that get channeled towards missions. Some of the money that we donate goes to the National Church, to the Presbytery, as well as through this house, and they go to help things like Upper Level, which is our young adult outreach ministry, a new church plant that we're starting in the nightclub. Uh, there was an article written in Faith Today that was just put out this week, so if you haven't had a chance to see that, you can follow that through the weekend emails uh, and get linked to that. Thank you for your generosity in supporting the ministries of St. Andrews. So we are, they asked me for a title for today's sermon and I realized I didn't do one. Uh, the title is Lent 3. There you go. <laughs> We're on the third week of Lent as we're journeying towards the cross and the empty grave. Along the way, we are sitting in the book of Mark and have been since Advent and Christmas season. And book of Mark uh, is this great festival speech, if you will, of how it is that the king of all kings has entered into our lives, how it is he has brought victory. But today we're coming to a very difficult passage. 
N.T. Wright tells the story of uh, sitting in a liturgical form of worship. He's a bishop in the Anglican Church. The gospel was being read, and it happened to be the story that we're about to read. Just off to the side of the sanctuary, a little boy was playing quietly with his toys. And at the end of this gospel lesson, the boy couldn't help but call out, that's not a very nice story. And he's right. The story today is not a very nice story, and we're going to be wondering why Jesus told it. What is Mark doing in placing it together with another story about paying taxes? And I think what we'll find is that the story of the tenants shows us a variety of perspectives that helps us not only to empathize with the human experience, but also to recognize Jesus as the satisfaction and the solution to our deep crying out. And then the taxes story will help us to know what we do as we wait for his kingdom to be realized. So I invite you to listen for those themes as we read this story together. We'll be reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. I'll read the portions in white, and I'll invite you to respond with the portions in yellow. Let's listen for those themes. Let's listen for the voice of Christ. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. Then he sent another servant to them. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son, So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, yes? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus has now entered into Jerusalem. The story comes to us amidst a portion of Mark's gospel where the person of Jesus is outlined as the fulfillment of Israel's religious faith. On Palm Sunday, we'll celebrate a story that actually happens before today's story, where Jesus enters as the king, and he comes in triumphantly. Chapter 13, after today's story, Jesus is touted as the prophet that sums the prophets of Israel, and in chapter 14, as the atoning sacrifice that satisfies the ritual life of Israel. Today, 
our story falls within a section where he is giving the law. He is seen as the new Moses, the one who brings the law to Israel. Now, what's hard for us, or at least hard for me, is that there is violence in every part of the story today. Was the law needed? (laughs) Absolutely. But in this case, it seems to result in tenants beating and killing the messengers, in the son being killed, in the landowner sending armies to punish the tenants. This is the Prince of Peace telling us this story. To get a sense for it, we perhaps need to look at the story through the lens of the various characters within it. Let's start with the vineyard. In the Bible, the Old Testament particularly, the vineyard is often referred a picture that's used to refer to the people of Israel. In the Old Testament prophets, the vineyard often went wrong. It grew wild and crazy, and it needed to be trimmed and brought back. But in today's story, the vineyard takes on a different meaning. The vineyard itself seems to be God's inner purpose. Israel, as the bearer of God's saving plan, the one through whom the Messiah would come, the vineyard is God's initiative to love humanity and bring humanity back into relationship, to redeem the whole of creation. The vineyard stands as the symbol of what it is God so desperately wants. Like in the Old Testament, God sent prophets to his people, but the people refused to listen. And now at the last, he is sending his son. Think that they killed the son too, so that they could have the vineyard for themselves. They want to control God's purposes. Now, before we give the tenants too hard a time, we actually see this happening an awful lot, both in the present day and in how we got to today. I had a great conversation with a dear friend of mine when I was in Israel the first time. I was 20, 21 years old, second year university, and I went to stay with him, and we went out to celebrate uh, somewhat covertly the New Year's holiday, because I happened to be there over New Year's. And as we went, he told me the story of uh, rabbis gathering together. It was an apocryphal story, perhaps. But the rabbis came together and they said, uh, the law has been given from God, but it is now our law. And one rabbi in particular stood up and said, no, this is God's law. And he said, I assure this to you, if the river should change its direction, that will be proof that it is God's law. The river changed direction. And still the rabbis said, no, this is our law now. He said, I tell you that if this house has the roof blown off but the walls stand up, it will be proof that this is God's law. And the roof was blown off and the walls stood standing and the rabbis said, nope, this is still our law. So the story goes, and before we give them too hard a time, we see this happening within Christianity as well. This is what has been handed to us as the tradition, and therefore it must be what is always and forever practiced, world without end, amen. (laughs) And in so doing, we end up missing out on the living, dynamic spirit of God at work among us. The flip is also true, where we say, nope, the world has changed around us, reason and experience tells us we need to change in order to speak to that, And yet, in so doing, we miss what God has spoken through ages past and how it is that he has revealed God's self to humanity. Neither tradition nor reason and experience are enough of a reason to change the message of God. Instead, God is the reason. His spirit at work in his church. When we side with just reason and tradition, when we side with just uh, trying to adjust to the world around us, what we're doing is seizing the vineyard for ourselves. Rather than allowing the vineyard, the life of God, to bubble up, the coming of the sun to the vineyard was the path for the vineyard's fulfillment. It was the way the vineyard could be most truly expressed in the world. That was true in the first century, 
as the events of Holy Week that we will commemorate in just a few weeks' time, as they unfolded, those first people who walked through that saw what incredible darkness would do to one whom they loved. And yet the coming of the Son took that, took the message, and helped them to connect this darkness with what God was doing, preserved the vineyard. The vineyard became, or rather the events of that week became enfolded into the vineyard. And it's true today as the first, or rather it's true then as the first Christians began to read the Old Testament, no longer as a book of 613 mitzvot, commandments that needed to be followed, but now as a document that pointed to the living Christ, the spirit of Christ at work in the early church, the vineyard growing and thriving. And it's still true today. We'll see that as a number of Jews who are Messianic Jews, and part of an organization called Jews for Jesus, who believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Uh, one of their, the Canadian director will actually be with us on March the 24th. You're invited to a Passover Seder where we'll share a meal together, and we'll discover how this community sees Jesus in this Jewish meal. The vineyard of God continues to thrive as we circle back to it over and again, but it thrives in the light of the sun. The sun helps the vineyard find fullest expression. So that's the vineyard. Let's take a quick look. There's the Christ in Passover. I'm not staying on top of this with myself here. Let's talk about the tenants. In this story, the tenants uh, are, they beat up multiple messengers, they kill the son, they hope to take and seize the vineyard for themselves. I wonder whether our understanding would change if we remember what tenant life was like in the first century. In the first century, families owned the land. They grew the crops, they reaped the benefits of that land. But after Assyrian and then Babylonian and then Roman occupation, those things began to change. By the time the Romans had taken control, taxes were so high that many of the people who had gleaned from the land needed to sell their land to a wealthy landowner who then could hire them as servants, read slaves, in order to work the land to pay off the tax debt that was only there because the empire had stretched and taken over their land to begin with. Does that sound familiar? In recent memory, we've seen the same thing happen within the last couple of hundred years here in North America. Whenever the wealth uh, gets consolidated among a very few, we can expect there to be pushback the French Revolution is perhaps the most famous example of this. When the land's proceeds are not equitably shared, people get understandably frustrated. And they get frustrated and it builds up to the point where like, I don't know what to do anymore except to lash out. Is that what these tenants were doing? As I mentioned, we see it in the way that the First Nations people were handled when empire began to infect North America as well. Different empires, per fact, but the same thing going on. People who had once gleaned from the land, now being displaced, and now being told that they served the empire. When read from the tenant's perspective, the violence, while not okay, is understandable. Each side has tried to win this battle for control of the land. And in a win-lose game, there's going to be losers, aren't there? And we're going to see escalation of the contest until such point as violence breaks out. It is a sad truth of humanity. Could the tenant's violence have been avoided? History says no. Could the death of Jesus, the son, have been avoided? Human nature says no, because when power is being threatened, violence is often used. There is a holy but here, isn't there? 
And that holy but is that Jesus' death, the son's death, in fact gets turned around and used as the path for freedom. That's why we celebrate on Good Friday. We commemorate his death because his death does not end the story, but becomes a means of new life. The tenants just acted as most humans would in their situation, and God used it for good. That's the takeaway for me. The purposes of God made good of the stuff that humans do by nature. That doesn't mean that it isn't an invitation for us to think about whether we are perpetuating empire, whether we are equitably distributing things with those around us. But that's another sermon. In addition to the tenants, there's the landowner. The landowner is coming to take what's his, the produce of the land. It's important to note that the landowner is following the law, that he is, in fact, doing what is right. His rights have been enshrined in law. Traditionally, we've interpreted the landowner as God. But this doesn't really sound like God. In fact, the commentators are agreed on this. How does a God own slaves? How does a loving God send his slaves over and again into situations where he knows they're going to be hurt and killed? It's almost like a despotic leaders who just keep recruiting more soldiers knowing that they're going to the front lines to be chopped down. That is not the kind of God we understand God to be. And what's more than he knows or at least has reasonable expectation to know what they will do to his son, but he sends his son anyways. Will they respect the son? Well, if this is God, then of course uh, he would know that they won't respect his son and that he is sending him to a painful and gruesome death. He's doing all of this Because the landowner wants to get what he wants. What does he want? His share of the produce is what the story tells us. He wants what is his. What does God want? Why might all of this happen? Even the son being killed, the landowner then sends armies to go and kill the tenants in order to kick them off the land and put new tenants in. It's a lose-lose situation. It's important to note that some 37 years, not that long, I'm 47, so shorter than I've lived, 37 years after, as these stories were being written down, Roman armies, because the Caesar had had enough of the agitation taking place in Judea at the time, Roman armies were sent and they burnt Jerusalem to the ground and tore the temple brick from brick and people were killed en masse and folks needed to flee. The Jews were expelled from the region and never allowed to come back again. For some, if the landowner is God, and the landowner takes on this kind of nature, it means that the story is a not-so-subtle reference to what we call supersessionism. Do you know what supersessionism is? That's all right. I didn't either. Supersessionism is when uh, the church is understood to replace Israel as the people of God. It's actually been a contributing factor to things like the Holocaust. We can kill Jews en masse, because they are no longer the people of God. The church is. We can see the problem with this, right? And when we interpret this story through that lens, this story becomes part of the proof that that is the case. I just need to say that that's a very sloppy reading of the story. It ignores other scriptures. We were talking this week in our uh, small groups about how the scriptures interpret the scriptures. It ignores scriptures like in Romans where Paul says that the Gentiles have been grafted into Israel. They didn't replace Israel. They became part of the people of God. So we can't go there. That is the supersessionist route with the story. If the landowner in this story is God, and God has planted this vineyard, 
Why would he send messenger after messenger if he knew they would be beaten and killed? Why would he send his own son? For God so loved the world that he gave his one, you know it, gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Why would the landowner send servant after servant, slave after slave, even his own son? For love. Because love is what makes that vineyard grow. It was God's intention to show his amazing love to humanity. He was willing even to give up his son for that. What would we give up for our family? These are some of the best stories that we tell. Fathers and mothers who sacrifice for the sake of their children. What would our Heavenly Father give up in order to see that vineyard thrive? From the landowner's perspective, sending the slaves and the son means God getting what he wants. And what God wants is you. What God wants is me. What he wants is a humanity that knows him and is in relationship with him. What he wants is a creation that has been redeemed and recreated so that it is functioning as he had designed it to. And that's worth the sacrifice. You with me still? So... If the son is the vineyard's way of finding fulfillment, if the son is the tenant's way of finding what they thought they wanted, if the son is the landowner's way of achieving what he wanted, we should probably pause and talk about the son, shouldn't we? Jesus uses an interesting phrase when he's saying, he says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. What he's saying is the son is vitally important to every aspect of this story. And that's why he tells it, in order to bring attention back to what God is doing through Jesus Christ. Uh, cornerstones, there's a cornerstone that's sitting uh, on the floor uh, underneath the sound amps cupboard over there. That's not what we have in mind. That cornerstone kind of says who was involved in the building of the project. It's usually put on the outside of a building. Because we build mostly stick and uh, gypsum buildings today, the idea of a cornerstone is a bit lost on us. But in Jesus' day, a cornerstone was the corner. It had to be perfectly level. It was the one that uh, they would adjust and make sure it had to be perfectly masoned as well so that every stone that lined up to it would be in a straight line. Because uh, anyone who has done navigating knows that if you're off a little bit, by the time you get up to the top of a 30-story building, you're going to be off a whole bunch, and that wall's going to fall over. So Jesus calls himself the chief cornerstone, the one that was rejected, the son, is the one against we each are measured, is the one against we each fit, is the one against which the temple is built so that his church, the people of God, can be the dwelling place of God. It's interesting to note that in this story, the son commits no violence. In this story, the son spoke for the father. In this story, the son calls for justice. Jesus, the son, still functions that way today. He becomes our cornerstone. This is a difficult story to preach. The little boy was right. This is a story of violence. It's not a very nice story, is it? Because it tells us what happens when the purposes of God are faced with the desire for power and the desire to win. J.R.R. Tolkien said it well. Humans crave power above all else. This story tells us what happens when that craving abuts the purposes of God. So, that's not very good news yet, is it? <laughs> so what do we do with this? Is there another way? Well, Mark tells us another way, and I'll wrap up with this. 
He says the other way, he doesn't explicitly tell us, but he pairs this story with what comes immediately after, a short little story about paying your taxes. The religious leaders are trying to trick Jesus. They want to use a kind of manipulation. They want to catch him in his words, and so they want to turn crowds against him. You see, Rome was not known for, its, uh, for being kind to people. So if Jesus says, yes, pay your taxes, then he's going to get all of the people upset with him. But if he says, no, don't pay your taxes, then he's going to get the empire upset with him. It seems like a no-win situation. Those scoundrels trying to trick him and trying to make a mess for him. They're manipulating. They're conniving. Jesus' response, in fact, gives us the third way, how it is we can live in this expectation of the kingdom coming. He says, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and you give to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Part of the reason we get caught in these conflicts, these contests where we want to win, is because we see it as either or. Either the Canucks win or the Leafs win. And Jim will tell me that neither are going to win. (laughs) But we can avoid these conflicts if we begin to use a different conjunction. Rather than either or, how about both and How about we give to Caesar and we give to God what is God's? This moves us away from the black and white thinking, from the zero-sum games where I can't win unless you lose, and it instead calls our attention to the both and. What do we do when we're faced with the win-lose, the either-or? Well, what if we gave to each what they needed? This is what we Christians call justice. It is a working for equal treatment under the law. At our best, it is the cornerstone, Christ, the cornerstone, of the society we are trying to build here in Canada. It is the third way, equal opportunity, equal accountability. We work not only for our good, but we work for the good of others. That's why we pay our taxes because they get us hospitals and roads and schools, not only benefiting us, but also benefiting our neighbors and our society. Do we like paying them? Heavens, no. Do they need to be paid? Heavens, yes. Both and. This is captured well for me in uh, one of my favorite movies from 2001, A Beautiful Mind tells the story of John Nash, who's a mathematician plagued by mental illness. He comes up with what will become a transformative way of thinking about economics and international relations, and he does that while he's at the bar with his friends. They see a beautiful woman, and like many young men, they consider which one of them is going to be able to take that woman out. And he comes to a conclusion there. I think we've got the clip. Incoming, gentlemen. Stop shuffling your papers for five seconds. I will not buy you gentlemen beer. Oh, we're not here for beer, my friend. Oh. Uh. Does anyone else feel she should be moving in slow motion? Uh. <laughs> will she want a large wedding, you think? Should we say swords, gentlemen? Pistols at dawn? Have you remembered nothing? Recall the lessons of Adam Smith, the father of modern economics. In, uh, in competition, individual, individual ambition, ambition serves, serves the common, common good. Exactly. <laughs> Every man for himself, gentlemen. Yeah, and those who strike out are stuck with their friends. Yeah, I'm not going to strike out. You can lead a blonde to water, but you can't make a drink. I don't think he said that. All right, nobody move. She's looking over again. Why is she looking at Nash? Oh, God. All right, he may have the upper hand now, but wait until he opens his mouth. <laughs> 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 you remember the last time? Oh, uh, yeah, that was the history book. <laughs> Adam Smith needs revision. What are you talking about? 
we all go for the blonde. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get her. So then we go for her friends. But they will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be second choice. But we'll fight if no one goes for the blonde. We don't get in each other's way. And we don't insult the other girls. That's the only way we win. That's the only way we all get laid. <laughs> Adam Smith said, the best result comes from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself, right? That's what he said, that's right? Incomplete. Incomplete. Okay? Because the best result would come from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself and the group. Ash, this is some way for you to get the blonde on your own. You can go to hell. Governing dynamics, gentlemen. Governing dynamics. Adam Smith. What's wrong? Thank you. In fact, when we get stuck into contests where there are winners and losers, everybody loses. Or you might have a few short-term winners, but in the end, we don't get justice. Justice is discovered as we seek not only our own benefit, but the benefit of others as well. That's why we pay taxes to Caesar, so that not only I get health care, but so do you, so that not only do I get roads to drive on, but so do you. There's lots of other incarnations of this as we've been discovering what Jesus said to be true. Marshall Rosenberg is one of the more famous ones. He wrote on nonviolent communication. Perhaps we'll incorporate that into another workshop. But for now, it's important for us to note that what Jesus was saying here is something that has been discovered by humans time and again. It was discovered by the mystics through Christian history. That we are not ultimately separate from, another, from one another. That we are all connected. And that if you want to win, we need to work for our brothers and sisters to win too. Can you imagine that world where that was our motivation? Imagine what the Middle East would look like or what Eastern Europe would look like if humans approached their contests not in either or terms, but both and terms. When the human lust for power comes up against the purposes of God, violence is the result. But in the kingdom of God, we are interested in both and solutions, working not only for the good of one, but for the good of all. May that same kingdom grow within us until we see it realized through us in the world around us. Amen? I'm going to invite the music team to come up at this time. We're preparing to gather around the table of the Lord. And here is a table that commemorates a violent act, the torture and murder of our master. And yet he prepared us in advance for how we should understand this violence that takes place as human power comes up against God's purposes. He redefines it for us. And so in remembering this, in taking his life into us, we are able to not only follow him, but be empowered to participate in the transforming work he is doing in the world. This table is not St. Andrew's table. It is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are welcome here because he has torn down all dividing walls in his body. You are welcome here no matter your age, your ethnicity, your gender, your sexuality. You are welcome here because this is a table where the Holy Christ welcomes you. Welcomes you to take into yourself his life and to know what it is to be part of his purposes. If you haven't already, I invite you at home to step out in just a moment and grab some elements. If you're in house here, the elements are in the foyer. Let's prepare our hearts and open our hearts again to receive the third way of Christ, the both and solution provided by his death. Would you lead us?
Our children are just returning now and they are welcome here. This is a family meal where we remember and commemorate what Christ has done for us that we might enjoy the third way. We'll give them just a moment to find their way in. Come on in, kids. We've been waiting for you. We've wanted you here. Come on in. We gather around this table to commune with Christ. Would you pray with me? Creator, Christ, Comforter, you who are beyond all reckoning, infinite one, you who have revealed the infinite to us, the imminent one, you who remain with us, dwelling within and through us in the world, the intimate one. We come to you knowing full well that our hearts crave and long for you, and yet so often we find ourselves in full-blown addiction to controlling and manipulating and trying to seize for ourselves our cravings. We exert violence towards each other, hurting each other, though unintentionally, sometimes intentionally, in our desire to win the contest instead of leaning on you and on your third way. We thank you that when Christ was killed, he took upon himself this darkness too, and he rendered it powerless. We thank you that in his suffering, he stands with those who suffer at the hands of power exerted in order to win. We thank you that in his suffering, he teaches us that the third way might involve sacrifice, but it will result in a triumphant and glorious end as the spirit of Christ infects the world and spreads like a good infection. So we gather before you and around your table, holy Christ, that we might be fed and nourished in your life to emulate you until your life is seen most clearly in us. To that end, we gather at this table and we pray that we might know you. May your spirit fall in this house and upon the people who gather here. May it fall upon this bread and this cup that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ. And having taken his life into us, we would be equipped to go into a world that is addicted to winning and we would demonstrate for them with our lives the third way. We ask all of these things because the Son has shown it to us, and in Him, your vineyard comes alive. And together we say, Amen. It was a moment of violence that was about to break out as the religious powers and the governing rulers wanted to win over Jesus. And on the night before that happened, the night of his betrayal, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread, shall we? The story continues that after the meal, Jesus took the fourth cup, the cup of redemption, and the old covenant he put aside and said, this covenant is now replaced by the new covenant, the one written in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Shall we drink? Would you pray with me? 
Ours is a world filled with tribalism and strife. Yours is a life that brings peace and justice. As we have fed on the body and blood of Christ, so may his life grow within us in the hours and days and weeks to come that we might carry his message of peace and justice anchored in your love for the world to all whom we meet. And as our witness, our sign, our seal, that we will do this in obedience to you, we use the words Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's conclude our time of worship with a response to our God, lifting our voices in praise to him. Would you stand as we sing? Grace that flows like a river, washing over me, fount of heaven, love of Christ, overflow in me. Thank you, Jesus. You said We're going to sing the doxology now together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Thank you for being a part of worship today. We have sung about life being a praise to God. Now I invite you to go out and to live those kinds of lives, not getting ensnared in contests of win and lose, but instead seeking justice for all so that they, together with us, might know the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and empowerment of his spirit in every moment of our lives and even forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go with God, friends. The earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Praise.